Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Alico Final Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab just on the right-hand corner of the screen. Type in your question at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company is most grateful. I'd now like to hand over to CEO. Jonathan Hunter, good afternoon. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning for those dialing in in different time zones as well. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, to present our full year results. Um, so without any further ado, we'll go into the highlights. Uh, we're really proud of the results um, that we that the Alico um, delivered in 2023. It, it, demonstrates the um, progress that we're making on our strategy. Uh, the key sort of takeaways is that we've developed predictable revenue for the future with our focus on um, recurring revenue, which is a high quality of, of revenue that we're generating. Uh, we've seen profit improvement um, compared to the interims. For those who are following, you see that the second half has been, we've been coming out of the U in terms of our SaaS transition and we're starting to see that accelerated growth and, and going into uh, quarter one of this year. And we expanded further internationally, which we'll go into some more detail on in a moment. The headline financials um, demonstrates that, you know, all the, all the key metrics are heading in the right direction. The headline revenues that were reported 5% up versus 2022, 6% at constant currency. Um, impressively, the, the uh, annualized recurring revenue, which is the December recurring revenue multiplied by 12, is 22.6 million pounds, up 24%. And we um, we shared as well the at the end of March 2024, that's now up to 24.5 million pounds. So we're seeing that growth in ARR. Total recurring revenues, which now represents 74% of uh, total revenues is 20.7 million, so a healthy increase there. And you see all the profit metrics are, are um, now um, going in the right direction and we're seeing the uh, operating uh, gearing coming through uh, and as a, uh, a show of confidence, we're proposing an increased dividend for the full year. Our 2023 operational highlights uh, represent the, the progress that we're making on our strategy. We focused on innovation, um, continuing to enhance our core products, ensuring that they remain um, market leaders in their markets, but also that we're continuing to add more value alongside those products and more value for our customers. Very proud to um, have won the best project management software of the year, again, for the 10th year in a row in the UK um, and that our, our project management and scheduling software is being recognised internationally as well with some very, very positive and encouraging feedback from all markets. Um, we've, we've focused as part of our uh, M&A search, um, we looked closely with our product roadmaps as well and, and as part of that identifying other technologies that are in the market that could be potential competitors or partners or acquisition targets, and um, that's really been, you know, uh, working with with our teams on on innovation, you know, and and us looking externally at opportunities. Some of those um, areas of our roadmap, we we identified there isn't any um, acquisition or partnership opportunity there, and therefore we do have to build those. And one of those was, um, you know, building our AI roadmap and strategy, and we were and we're proud to release earlier this year Asta GPT, which is our first um, AI module which uses generative AI technology. Strengthen the business, continuing to focus on ESG. Made solid progress on on ESG by appointing a subcommittee of the board and also an ESG implementation team, and. Um, in terms of acquisitions, we said we would continue to, to look for acquisitions. We made a we announced an acquisition um, mid year 2023, but a further uh, smaller acquisition last week, Vertical Digital. So we'll provide some more information on that in a moment. 
In terms of growth, we had a real focus on go to market and, and our initiatives there. That continues into 2024. We carried out sales enablement training uh, with all of our sales teams using our, the best skills and knowledge that we have in house. We transitioned to SaaS in the US, so subscription revenue from one of Perpetual through our reseller channel. And we also introduced a direct sales approach within the US, which started in May and resulted in 44 new logos uh, acquired from May to the end of the year. So we're pleased with the with the uh, progress we're making in the US there. Just for those that are uh, new to us, new to Alico, a bit of background. It's um, software uh, and services business that's focused on the construction sector as well as property and real estate we have about now as of the uh, the recent announcement of the acquisition we have 290 employees in the uk europe usa and australia our core markets where our customers uh, where we service our customers directly 96 percent of our, our revenues are um, direct to market or direct to customer those core markets are the uk scandinavia germany netherlands and the us and you can see the uh, the market positions over on the bottom right there. Um, we've got strong positions within our core markets and, and growing presence um, within the US. Let's say that as, a, as an opportunity for growth for us. In terms of our portfolio, um, we cover different stages of the building life cycle. So from early stage of BIM design and standards, program and uh, portfolio project management, through to cost estimating, um, project scheduling and management, and maintenance and management, management post-construction facilities, maintenance and management. So there's different customer groups within each, each stage of the life cycle, but the common theme is the time and task and cost management across those um, different disciplines. We also, so that's what we call our, our building life cycle product portfolio. We have uh, an, a second group called CAD and visualization, and that's more niche in nature of those products. So that's the timber engineering software, so you stack on, stack on framing, and also views, data, and visualization, which is, is niche for the interiors um, segment, doing AI and, and, and different um, technologies to help consumers make buying decisions within that market. Still related to the built environment, I call. So with that, I'd, I'd like to um, hand over to Neil to take you through more depth on the financials. Super. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning to, to, to all of you watching. Thanks very much for joining us. And I have great pleasure to take you through the financials, um, which you can see there in overview are uh, really across the board, um, very pleasing to, to deliver and to report. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, take you through what I usually do in terms of you know, the headlines, um, then we'll go through the PL, the cash uh, balance sheet, and a little bit more colour on the revenue as well, um, <clears throat> which I'll take you through and, and then hand you back to Jonathan. So, with regard to these first highlights, the way they're split out, they're very much along the top around the revenues, which I'll, I'll go into to some depth, as I say, but, but come back to, and second, more profitability and cash along the bottom. Uh, with regard to the first ones, uh, uh, where we touched on, we were obviously um, we we've, we've come around the uh, the U shape of that SaaS transition. This is briefly for those that are less familiar with the story. That effectively moving from perpetual one-off licenses, lots of up upfront revenue, through to you know a more recurring nature, more predictable, and and, and really. Um, you know, it's it, it, we're now in that upwards level and that trajectory, which is absolutely fantastic to see. And, and uh, you know, we were actually ahead on revenues and also strong on profit as well compared to to what we were expecting as well and, and market expectations. So always good to see. Now, with regard to the revenues, first of all, um, as Jonathan mentioned, the first one is really the exit one. Uh, that's the end of the year times by 12, so that's up by 24%. The second is the recurring revenues across the whole of the period up to the 31 December year end uh, that we had, and that's 22% of overall revenues as well. So um, really strong performances there. 
we had a number of um, ups and downs in terms of um, M&A strategic changes in, in the year vis-a-vis uh, -vis the 22 previous comparative period. So just an overview here only, and I'll come back in measure on a few of them. Um, I'll just talk you through those rather than all the dynamics of the numbers. So first of all, in February, we announced that we were divesting uh, Archon, which is a German architectural CAD business, um, and that was um, uh, so it was it was a it was a, a slightly underperforming business, and in line with our overall strategic fit and shareholder value, uh, we divested that actually the gain and the proceeds of which we we actually uh, provided back to shareholders in terms of a special dividend as well. And then secondly, also as Jonathan mentioned, we uh, acquired Best Outcome for a net sort of overall outflow of 3.8 um, million in the year. And we took in their numbers from the second half of 2023. And also during the year, there were three predominantly Nordic uh, end of life products. Two were internal to us, one where we acted as a reseller. Uh, which were so those products were at end of life. They were actually contributors to the group, but but we felt that uh, the further investment uh, needed in those products uh, warranted didn't quite give the paybacks and the revenues in in a you know a, a near term perspective from shareholder perspective. So so further sort of focus on um, shareholder value in the product portfolio and so forth. So there's various things, and if you if you take all of those out, effectively the underlying recurring revenue rates are uh, moving by 17%, which is the third metric there. Skipping quite quickly through the headline numbers, which obviously the full effects of which SaaS transition haven't yet worked through, but the headline numbers are still ahead year on year, as we promised and have delivered, and as I say, slightly ahead. So 5% more on in terms of the reported numbers, 6% on a constant currency basis, 7%. If you, if you then strip out some of those one-offs that I've mentioned as well. Obviously, the focus on enhanced uh, profitability and, and margins by both the divestment of that one business and the end of life of those other products has largely contributed to uh, a very sizable and, and pleasant uh, increase in the gross margins um, and with other sort of more minor mix effects as well. Across the board, in terms of profitability, every metric, be it reported or adjusted, is positive and, and nicely positive. And what you're starting to see is that operational gearing, as Jonathan mentioned, coming through. So that's really, really good to see. Um, overall cash was down uh, at 10.9 million. Uh, but that is, if you actually uh, add back in the uh, acquisition uh, outflow, uh, for best outcome in the year in terms of the acquisition then actually otherwise uh, all other things being equal it would have been 18 percent ahead and then finally dividend um and jonathan will come back to it but you know as an expression of confidence in the future to reward our supporters shareholders uh, we are again increasing the final on top of an increased interim on cross in line with other increases in recent years as well and the special dividend so actually that's 14 percent up on the uh, previous year so that's really uh, hopefully will be well received. Now, uh, just a little bit more on the PL, if I may. Um, I've, I've sort of spoken about the um, overall revenues, and I'll say I will come back to them. So I'm going to actually just take it and uh, looking at the admin OPEX side of things first of all. As you can see there, um, that's moved up by 1.4 million in the year um, to 21.9 against the 20.5. Now, um, if you actually strip out some of those ups and downs on the M&A and the strategic moves and initiatives that are underway, what, uh, what you actually get back to is more like a 1 million or a 5% increase. Um, then there are some other one-offs. There was an adverse FX swing of about 0.3 between the periods. Share-based payments are rather the same. There's a little bit of uh, extra acquisition costs associated with advisors fees and stamp duties to do with the best outcome acquisition. Um, uh, and then actually amortization was a little bit ahead at 1.8 against um, uh, 1.6 for the previous year. So really, uh, regarding that, the actual underlying increase is, is about approximately 4% in line with sort of salary related inflation and so forth. Obviously, that then leads to operating profit being ahead. We actually have that gain on business disposal associated with the Arcon divestment that I mentioned, uh, a little bit of positive um, 
uh, financial net income there and PPT ahead, tax, tax is higher, but it's higher in longer terms and a little bit in effective rate terms, higher because of higher taxes. Um, actually, uh, the UK tax weighted rate is higher as well uh, in terms of the jurisdiction. It's one of our core markets. And of course, there are, are deferred tax um, elements associated with um, the purchase of acquisition intangibles as well. As I say, profit after tax, EBITDA, everything else, um, much more uh, moving up in line now. A little bit more on the cash, a uh, little bit more colour here. So on the top left, you see the um, uh, the reduction in cash is primarily due to the uh, acquisition. And um, what you can see in the right hand side in terms of the bridge is that's very much the largest uh, outflow of 3.8, uh, sort of halfway along the, the other bigger diagram. Investment in D continued um, at 2.2 uh, million, uh, slightly ahead of, of previous years as well. And dividends, dividends a little bit higher than normal, also because of that special dividend that I mentioned earlier. Overall, uh, cash generated from operations after working capital was 6.4 million against 6.3. And free cash flow, and, and we're really quite hard on ourselves in free cash flow, it's not the tradi traditional method of just after investment costs and capex, it's also after expenditure on tax and so forth, and paying tax bills and so forth. Actually, that was uh, 3.8 against the previous year as well, of 3.8. So overall, some really, really good moves there. We remain, I should say, uh, for the benefit of those who, who know us less, uh, free of debt, uh, with obviously significant cash and uh, to deploy both for shareholder returns, but also for uh, inorganic as well as our organic R&D roadmap purposes as well. Moving on just to the balance sheet, because of some of those strategic initiatives, uh, the balance sheet is a little bit coloured around. So, for example, in 2022, some assets were held for sale, which obviously were sold and then moved out. Equally, uh, with the acquisition of best outcome, that leads to bringing on things like brand values and uh, customer list values and also R&D values. And actually, that's one of the key drivers behind the increase in capitalised development costs, which is obviously one of the metrics that actually does include a fair value of bringing on the de development cost uh, capitalised uh, by about 0.7. So that's one of the sort of big ones. And then obviously, clearly, the goodwill after those other intangibles have been val valued and separated out. Uh, we've spoken a little bit around the, the tax and the deferred tax um, and obviously receivables and payables very much in line with sort of trading and so forth uh, and, and also clearly on cash. I think the other interesting uh, here, one here is around the deferred income. And although actually, you know, the majority of the group's um, recurring revenue contracts are on, on a sort of one year basis, uh, sometimes up to three years, but the majority of one year. Um, actually, deferred income uh, is, is very nicely ahead as well. So that's ahead by 26%. And even if you strip out the 1 million that became part of the acquisition for best outcome in terms of their deferred income, uh, which is still clearly part of the ongoing group, underlying deferred revenue still grew by 13%. So that's another good measure of the future coming through, so which is really, really fantastic. So, um, on to um, just a little bit more colour on that revenue, uh, and then I'll hand you back to Jonathan. So, so just on um, the left hand side, what you see here is, um, you know, that fruition, that, that fruits of the labour is really coming through now on the SaaS transition and also clearly on other organic growth initiatives. So we've got recurring revenues, we mentioned earlier, now 74% of the group, you can see that in the central bar co column of the left hand side. And so, you know, what does that mean? It means that you know, as we enter the year, 74% of the previous year's revenues are on that recurring sort of underpin basis. So that really brings predictability, a sustainability, a durability and a, and a forecastability for the whole group, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and, you know, gives us a great uh, position of growth to, to grow further from um, on the on the inorganic side as well. Perpetual actually is actually down to about 5%. That is lumpy, can go up and down. Services income slightly down. Um, we That is the one area, as we mentioned at the interims, where sometimes we see is a little bit more related to the deferral of um, sort of discretionary uh, expenditures uh, in the slightly uneconomic times, obviously, with, you know, um, where, where, where companies are looking and, and keeping the, the sort of tight holes on their budgets, understandably. But actually, proportionally in terms, um, there's been a lot of uh, 
initiatives underway on that and you know actually the gap is closed somewhat from what we saw at the interim as well so that's also on a good trajectory in the middle uh, what you see is really uh, the blue section has grown from 65 percent to 71 percent and that's the building life cycle part of the business uh, and, and that's really showing higher levels of growth um, than the visualization can and hence why there's a bigger proportion of the group uh, you can also see in the gray area uh, a slight reduction and that also lends itself back to some of that to end of life products that we mentioned on the right um, when when we sort of split out the headline geographies and the one right at the very top talks about how 96 percent of what we do is direct to to market rather than say through value-added resellers for the remainder the, on the right, it is, I, I would sort of um, obviously let, caution to that people are aware that's obviously the headline revenues, not necessarily the underlying SaaS relating revenues coming through. And, you know, we are a, a group of diverse uh, but also related portfolio of solutions in different geographies and embarking at slightly different times for cultural, market, legal, commercial reasons at different levels on the SaaS uh, transition. So uh, you can see that UK is clearly ahead and was one of the first embarking on that and its headline revenues nicely ahead. That does include best outcome just for the sake of transparency. Nordic's slightly behind. Nordic's uh, obviously where the focus of some of those end of lives were. So that would that explains a very large part of it. Otherwise would have been considerably ahead and nicely ahead on the recurring revenue side as well. Also to mention that's where some of that point three um, FX swing as well, particularly on the Swedish Krona to Sterling. On Germany, uh, clearly we had the divestment of the Arcon business, which was very much focused around Germany as well. Um, so again, that would have otherwise been significantly ahead. On the rest of Europe, actually, our Benelux and Netherlands location moving nicely ahead. It's really bits and pieces from elsewhere. And also there's some transitional effects there on the SaaS. And on the US, that's actually ahead, even though they're sort of quite early on in that SaaS transition journey moving as Jonathan uh, will probably take you through on, on, on some of the reseller base as well. So, um, you know, th there's more to come there. And obviously uh, that is headline revenue rather than anything else. And I guess probably just to give you a little flavor of where things have been and where <laughs> we're going. You know, we've gone from a position where prior to the SaaS transition, we were, um, I think, 48 percent, certainly below 50 percent in terms of recurring revenues to now what is nearly 75% uh, of those overall revenues and uh, more to come as you can see in, in the market consensus forecast and so forth. So um, with that, I'll hand back over to Jonathan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. So uh, for, part, for this part of the presentation, I'd like to um, take you through some of the market drivers um, a little bit of colour on the acquisitions and also how our customers are benefiting from the use of our software. This is a bit of a busy slide, but on the on the left, you see that, um, you know, there's, uh, there's some key changes in market characteristics within the built environment and the built environment, especially technology within the built environment is a very exciting space to be at the moment. I think that the the construction market remains buoyant despite what we hear. There's a, a huge driver in terms of just population growth, which is um, driving demand for housing as well as infrastructure. Um, but then our clients, who are the general contractors and, and building operators, um, are receiving demands from their clients <laughs> for more sophisticated buildings. I think generally construction projects are becoming more complex and require um, more detailed management. There's regulation and, and demands there. We heard about the, you know, the Safety Act in the UK for house builders. And then there's um, you know, further um, demands on our customers when it comes to uh, environmental, social and governance, you know, carbon calculation and, and measurement during the construction phase, but also post-construction operating the asset um, and how that, you know, what impact that will have on the environment. There's a, um, a drive for modern methods of construction and new construction techniques and, and robotics and, and, and things are starting to look very interesting. And a general um, transformation of our customers' businesses um, into a digital businesses. So there's a lot of focus on data. There's a lot of data being collected. 
a lot of different systems being used um, coming out of COVID when, when our customers moved to, to working remotely. Um, there was a lot of technology adoption and, and now it's sort of unpicking and, and you know piecing together what's going to be what's going to make sense for the long term. And there's also many sort of paper-driven workflows and processes that need to um, to move to a digital world. So there's there's many, many factors and, and many, many challenges within the industry, which makes it very exciting for, for companies like Alico. Um, and and we're um, you know our vision is to to solve those challenges and we're, we're setting out to do those in many different ways. So if we look at our, our strategy and our pillars, um, the key focus to our growth. If we if you are following us for for the last um, couple of periods, we we announced um, early in our SaaS transition at that stage a, a new strategic direction and, and that really involved ensuring that the business and the operating model was um, one that would supplement growth. So you see along the bottom there, there's been a lot of focus on ensuring we're a profitable financial platform, you know, cash positive, cash generative. Um, we're very customer focused. We've come from being a construction business to being a construction software business. So we know our customers because we were our customers. Um, culture and values has been, uh, you know, we've been um, focused on as well in terms of improving, defining our culture and incentivizing the, the correct behaviours within our, our teams to, to drive um, towards our vision and our goals. And as a result, you know, that's been proven with our great place to work certification that we're very proud of. We're also attracting top talent and, you know, um, building a reputation as a, as a trusted partner in the industry, which is, is certainly been our strategic ambition as well. So, and I mentioned the SG earlier on in the presentation. Um, if I start in the middle, innovation and technology, that's our, our lifeblood and that's where Alico um, and our colleagues, I think, are, are very confident and um you know, feel, feel comfortable around the innovation and technology we deliver. They're all very highly technical um, and, you know, love what they do, love solving problems for our customers. Um, so that's a key pillar to our, our strategy is to retain our innovation and ensure that we remain ahead and we're continuing to add value for our clients. <clears throat> So what that brings in terms of strategic initiatives is to ensure that we're enhancing and continuing to enhance our existing solutions. We're looking at ecosystems and partnerships because we know that as a business, you know, no, no single technology platform is going to solve every challenge within our customers' business. So we need to be open in terms of our uh, data formats and you know, the way we work with other systems. and you know, critical to every project is the time and task management. And, and that's where um, Alico had, Alico, well, that's what we deliver as a core application. And um, therefore linking in and out of that master plan and master schedule is important for, for other businesses and for our clients. And then we've got a um, an ambition to help our customers digitalize and not just digitize. And, and what we mean by that is not just sell a piece of technology to take um, a manual paper process and, and make that digital, which is what we saw during the COVID period with many, many companies, you know, adopting, um, you know, digital forms and so forth, but, but rather improve that process because we've seen um, productivity overall with, with um, across many regions in the construction sector actually decline coming out of COVID. And we, we believe that that's, you know, that's a form of digitizing where a process may have taken five minutes, a form might have taken five minutes to complete on site on pa with paper and then completing that on an iPad now, you know, requires drop downs and takes 15 minutes, you know, so it's, so that's just a simple example of where digitization hasn't worked and our, our um, mindset is around digitalizing. So what data can we grab and, and used to pre-populate that form. So, so it's just a minimal amount of time is required to, to complete it and sign it off. So um, that's where we're adding value. That's our, that's our ethos. Uh, one box to the left, the, the pillar to the left is our go-to-market and, and that's a real focus um, coming into our SaaS um, 
SAS transition and of course continuing. We had to really work and, and closely with the customers to ensure they stayed with us and they, you know, they had high retention rates, so that's ongoing, but also that they're getting more value from our products and they're utilising the capabilities that we can offer. So with that, we've been focused on and continue to develop our identity and you know, sharing with customers our best capabilities that we have that provides stickiness and also attracts new, new customers. Um, we've been working with, with uh, partners, channel partners, but also technology partners. And, and um, we've increased our capacity for customer success and premium support. I mentioned the, the Asta GPT um, module uh, earlier, which is providing um, quick responses and support for our customers, which saves them time, and that's actually reducing our support queries um, that are coming through to our support hotline and allowing our support team to focus on more of that premium support. For example, not just how to use the software, but how can I um, get a better schedule? How can I quality check the schedule and see if there's risks of you know, failure and so forth? Or how do I reschedule? So providing customers with, with more value there. And as we're introducing new customers, that team is also looking at um, time to value. So from the time of placing the order to getting value out of the solutions. And then customer verticals and, and market diversification. We've been, um, part of our strategy has been to um, continue to enhance our systems, but also develop alongside those to, to build out a suite of solutions within planning and, and estimating and so forth, so that we can um, offer more value and diversify within our, our customer logo. So not just selling to an individual, but to a department and then to the wider organisation, offering more services and, and capability where we're now elevated out our discussion and being part of that organization's strategic IT transformation journey. And that's an ongoing process which is which is um, which is um, we're continuing to see opportunities for and, and we're seeing that as the industry is transforming as well and thinking differently about technology. Um, mergers and acquisitions in organic uh, growth is also a pillar to our strategy. We actually have um, uh, we have a, a, a criteria broken into three types that we're searching. So prof profitable revenue generating businesses that are in complementary markets and best outcome, the acquisition we made last year sits in that, that uh, criteria. Type B, which is proven technology or technology capability that can advance our roadmap, and that's the vertical digital acquisition that's gives us the capability for further R&D and, and um, um, expertise there. And then type C is next generation technology, which could be coming from another sector, another industry that's slightly ahead in terms of that digital transformation journey um, and, and repurposing that and spotting that for uh, the built environment. And um, vertical digital brings brings elements of that as well. So I'll, I'll that's a good segue into our uh, giving you a bit more information about the acquisitions we made during the last 12 months. So the first thing, best outcome, we've got the transaction metrics there. Um, it was on, con the consideration was uh, 4.8 million pounds. You can see there, that was a cash consideration, but the, the business also had almost 1.3 million of cash within the business. So the net consideration was 3.6 million. Um, Best Outcome provides a it's a it's a well established business, um, very well developed software, uh, SaaS software, um, very good interface, so it's intuitive and and is adopted by by people within an organisation very quickly, very secure as well. So ISO twenty seven thousand and one security credentials listed on the government's G Cloud, um, and servicing in fact the largest supplier to the NHS for PPM, Portfolio Project Management Software. You can see some of the customers there. There's a broad base of customers. The product is very sticky and it's used for, um, it, it complements our existing scheduling software, which is designed, our existing software is designed for very complex projects with a task and, and detailed sort of um, build up of the schedule and program of works. 
PM3 best outcome is a outcomes focused uh, project management solution. So first focusing on what are the objectives of the project and working down into the depths of the, um, the Gantt chart and Kanban boards and the details for managing that. Very good reporting tool as well for C-suite and, and different, um, different stakeholders within an organisation. The integration of the business has been going very well. We actually use the PM3 software required for the integration plan uh, and to manage that. Um, we, we restructured the sales team, um, so we're focused, you know, I think we're, we're, we're getting better focus there on sales and got some very good pipeline coming through as well. Um, and we introduced the product to our reseller network as well. So, so those might have seen who follow us on the LinkedIn would see that our Australian reseller are promoting best outcome PM3 and they've resourced it with marketing and salespeople as well. So um, we're very pleased with um, the way best outcome is progressing and integrated into the business. Now, more recently um, and last week, uh, we announced the acquisition of Vertical Digital, which is a, a small um, but very important acquisition for the group. It's a, a specialist custom software development business based in Romania. But uh, despite being in, in Romania, they only have one Romanian client, actually, all of their clients, you can see some logos there, are a multinational, um, a lot around the DAC region and also some in the US and Canada. Um, they've, they've really proven to, to um, I think, quite, yeah, proven to, to have a diverse skill set, but also be able to scale and flex um, their development capability up and down, they, they have 17 um, permanent staff, including the founders, and then a pool of about 30 to 35 contractors that have specialist skills that they can bring into a project or um, you know, within, a, within a team or a client. Um, so that gives Alico a very um, needed capability as we're looking at our future development roadmap. Um, our R&D colleagues very much know our, our core product set. They know the technology very well. They know our customers and audience uh, and, and so forth. As we're, as we're developing on new tech stacks or, or looking at new innovation, um, we would ordinarily have to hire those skills in or train the existing colleagues. Um, and what Vertical Digital brings um, on day one is that capability. They've got a very broad broad understanding and can bring and, and supply um, different technical capability around mobile and cloud and um, you know, even DevOps. Um, so there were, there were roles that we were looking to recruit um, and you know, we've de-risked that by bringing in Vertical Digital, which um, I, did, I must point out is a profitable business as well. Um, it also, what we've what it's brought us is some very key um, leadership colleagues. So Alex Geboyanu is joining us as the group CTO. And of course, he's, he's built the business with his partner, uh, Dan Pop, who's heading our Eastern European business unit now, which is Vertical Digital, but we have some resellers there in, in that market. And we want to take advantage of any sort of opportunities that may uh, appear there as well. But Alex, um, what Alex brings as a CTO is that of course, he's got 15 years experience as a CTO working on over 100 projects professional certified trainer advising for, for clients at PwC and Deloitte and so forth. Um, but, but also a, he's an entrepreneurial and commercial mindset. Um, and that was really important for us as we're, as we're um, investing in R&D. We want to ensure that, that firstly, the customer problems are being solved and that commercially makes sense as well. So we do a lot of business cases and R&D cases internally when we're embarking on new projects. Um, and then for our clients, with as they're tr transforming and digitally, you know, linking their systems together, we do get requests from time to time for integration projects, um, support in in transitions and uh, from from one software solution to another, and then help with dashboard reporting, etc. So, having that capability for our clients is very reassuring as well, and being able to to scale that up and down is of course um, very very much an advantage and it protects our existing R&D team from being taken off their roadmaps and you know working on clients so uh, very very uh, you know happy with the, with the acquisition and we believe it's going to add a lot of value to the business. So finally just a couple of 
customer case studies because we really love to show how we're helping our customers solve problems. And uh, the first is um, for a, a company called McGee Construction. They're a London-based um, specialist engineering contractor. Uh, and the project though they were using Aster on, they use Aster on several projects. Um, Aster is our project scheduling and project management software. Um, it was for Claridge's Hotel, which was this, this project was actually um, on a BBC documentary. Um, so it's a very ambitious um, mega project. In fact, a mega basement. They uh, constructed five storeys below ground under the hotel in Mayfair. And um, whilst the hotel was still being occupied and they had guests coming in and staying and, and sleeping there while the basement was being dug down. Um, every aspect of the project from slight deliveries, logistics, working, working hours, resources, was all managed using Aster Power Project, our software. So project critical, any delays, you know, the, the delay of materials arriving, for example, all of that is managed within the software and it's rolling, you know, rolling out what impact that could have and helping the, the project planner and manager get the project back on track by, um, you know, managing that. So, so really critical and important for, for such a complex project. Moving to Sweden, uh, very proud to have um, been working with an existing power project customer, GBJ Big. Um, and they, as I said, they were using Power Project, but uh, they also had a demand from the Swedish Housing Agency to provide climate decora declarations for their new construction. Um, well, just a, a bit about uh, uh, GBJ. They're actually a timber frame house builder, a uh, very specialist uh, contractor, timber construction contractor. Um, so with the requirement for the, um, the climate declarations and climate estimating, they actually um, bought our BidCon software, which is a cost estimation software for construction. But we've also um, added the ability to calculate carbon alongside those construction costs. So, you know, that's been really well received. It's actually been endorsed by the Swedish government and um, it's actually a regulatory requirement now in Sweden to provide those uh, declarations during the planning. And finally, we're, we're really proud to be working with Whitbread, um, who are using PM3, so that's the best outcome software that, that's a, um, part of the acquisition we made. Um, and they're using it on their Premier Inn uh, brand. Every project within Premier Inn is centralized and managed within PM3. And you can see a, a small snippet of the screen of the sort of dashboard that gives all the, the sort of KPIs and, and performance of that project and risk and who's involved, et cetera. So um, in order to deliver that, uh, the interface had to be completely uh, intuitive because every everyone working on a project is inputting in, and using PM3 in the organization and, and also the reports are tailored for, for different departments different individuals and then the security and permissions you could imagine you, you don't want every everyone on the project or in the organization having access to everything so that's where we really come you know to our strength in terms of the security the segmenting of data the reporting and then the usability and, and you know, a lot of work has gone into the interface to ensure that it's accessible for those that are vision impaired as well. Um, and in fact, uh, last week we, we launched a refresh to the interface with Kanban board capability. So there's further enhancements going on within PM3, which we're really, really pleased to, to see. So in summary, we're really pleased to, um, to see the results for 2023, which demonstrates the progress we're making on our strategy. We, we said we would focus on that recurring revenue and it's now reached 74% of our total revenue. And it's continuing to grow as we, as we stated, um, the March ARR is now 24.5 million pounds. And um, we're continuing to, to seek and, and look for acquisitions, potential acquisitions, but as well as, you know, partnerships and uh, as we're doing that and, and ensuring that those opportunities will provide real value to the business. Um, so we're very careful in, in our search and, and how much um, 
you know how that fits into our product roadmap and our overall strategy. Um, so with that, I think uh, you know we demonstrated there's an increase in dividend as well, and we just want to um, demonstrate that we're really positive and confident with the outlook for the rest of the year and the future. Really. Okay. So I will um, just stop there, and um, that concludes the presentation. So I'd like to open up for questions if any folks have any. We'll be happy to take those. Okay, so there's a several questions that have come through. So I'll just, um, if you, if I just read those out, and then we will um, attempt to answer all of those. So the first one uh, I see is from Howard M. Thank you, Howard. Could you elaborate on the U.S. policy of direct to market and what your hopes are for this? Um, absolutely. Sorry, I just sent the system. Um, so. Yes, absolutely. So the um, historically we had uh, entered the US market with the reseller channel, um, primarily focused on Asta Power Project. That's a scheduling software that, that's uh, you know world class, best software for the last ten years in the UK. Um, and when we were carrying out our, our sort of strategic review and looking at the US uh, more closely, we identified that. Um, there was quite a lot of opportunity that um, could potentially be serviced directly and, and you know, we were building up um, leads and, and pipeline and, and, and sharing that with resellers, but then um, took a view to work with the resellers and, and actually sell and, and offer, those, um, offer those customers direct, you know, software directly. So in terms of the progress and phasing, um, if we if we think about the resellers that had a um, we have 15 resellers in the US, um, when we were carrying out our SaaS transition, when we were looking at the progress the resellers were making on that SaaS transition, and also the fact that our, our version of Asta that we released last year was only was SaaS only, there's no going back to the perpetual model. We actually mandated a switch to SaaS and subscription um, at the end of Q1 last year in the US for all resellers. And at the same time, we announced that we were entering the market directly with our first sales hire in May of um, 2023. And by the end of that first half, of course, we, we planned and, and built pipeline before then. We, we, um, we attracted 13 new logos at the end of the first half, I think I shared. And then at the end of the year, um, we closed the year with 44 new logos, new customers. Now. And that was direct with our own salespeople. Um, we saw that opportunity developing. So actually in November, we hired a further sales colleague uh, for the US. And that's our approach is, is we're going to continue to hire and resource as we um, assess the market position, assess the growth and, and the opportunity, and then we're going to you know, invest in that market. Um, and any sort of whale deals, the large opportunities, enterprise customers that we have that um, we, we are servicing and supporting our US colleagues from the UK. But if there's any sort of rapid scale up, then we also got the reseller network that we, we can rely upon to help deliver those larger clients. Um, so we've, we've, we've got a, a you know pretty low risk approach there, but you know, the investment is going in as the market develops. Um, in terms of just to give you some colour on the market and, and how that's progressing, that the incumbent is um, there's two major players, Microsoft Project and Oracle P6. Um, Microsoft is, is uh, more of a, a broader um, planning tool, not dedicated to the construction and complexities and different resourcing and so forth that's required in construction. And, and P6 has been in the market well established in the US. Um, that's the Oracle solution. Um, but we've we've been um, successful, I guess, in, in in demonstrating to our customers that the workflows and you know there's an improvement in terms of using our software. So we have seen clients um, moving away and, and moving to Asta, and that was evident in our user forum, which we had in February of this year. We had a customer called Mortensen. They're a, 
a, a top 400, in fact, top 100, I think, uh, main contractor that specializes in multi-disciplines, infrastructure, construction, wind and energy and, and civils. And, and they've, um, they've, they announced that 50% of their projects are now run and manage using Aster. So it just demonstrates that, you know, they and that's growing. They, they initially started with just one division, their smallest, which was their wind and energy. And over, over um, a, a couple of years period, they're expanding uh, more and more. And we had another client attend um, Pennsylvania Department of Transport, and they were presenting uh, the presentation they shared at the Autodesk University in Las Vegas as well, actually, which we're very proud that, that our name came up there. Um, but they were sharing how they've linked 14 different software solutions to ASTA and the data within ASTA, and that's the core scheduling data, it's the master plan. So, um, you know, they're getting value there through integration and their approach was to mandate the use of ASTA across all the projects in the state of Pennsylvania, all road projects. Um, and everyone that's working on the road projects have to report, they receive their reports and have to report back within ASTA. So um, very, very much, I guess that helps, I hope that helps demonstrate the quality of software that we're providing. And that it's, it, you know, it's all about building that reputation. The challenge for us is getting recognised as a better solution, as a market leading solution that is genuinely solving problems. Um, and, you know, we're pleased to say that the momentum is starting to build, but it will take a little bit of time before, you know, the market realises that there's something different there. Shall I take the second one, Jonathan? Um, it's just on the... Um How's, how's the transition, a uh, question from John, thank you for that, John. How, how has the transition to a SaaS and subscription model impacted the revenue streams, particularly in terms of recurring revenue growth? Um, I imagine, John, that you're probably a, a, a proficient at everything on this, but I'll, I'm going to start at square one and work forward if that's okay. So I think really um, hinted a little bit earlier, but for those perhaps a little less aware, obviously if you're with perpetual um, licenses, um, you know, rather like your old Microsoft ones before it moved to Microsoft 365, you need to have that, perhaps the maintenance and support, even if you didn't have that, you'd stay with it and so forth. And, 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 and but obviously with, with recurring revenues, um, it's a lower entry point for customers. Um, and there are many other, you know, modularizations and other potential opportunities by doing that. So a little bit more like a selection box, a chocolate selection box, if you like. Um, compared to everything all in one one overall license and, and in terms of the financials of that clearly that one overall license is you know in theory it's a it's a slug but then of, of money and, and revenue but then you know you kind of have to replace that every year rather than the ongoing developing and working in partnership with your customers and really sort of expanding landing and expanding new territories but also upselling and expanding with existing customers which is very very important when when we operate, you know, more or less on a sort of licensee model, and they they use us increasingly in the businesses, so that you know, loads of headroom for growth in that respect. So that's that's kind of the financials in terms of each revenue stream. I mean, I guess you may be inferring, you know, kind of obviously within the business, and and as Jonathan mentioned, um, mentioned, you know, obviously, you know, we could be looking at thirty different sort of revenue streams if you like, but if you were to try and class them try and classify them together somewhat what you'd have is building life cycle which has been very much the focus of um the SaaS transition and you can see that in the growth numbers i showed earlier where it moved to 71 percent um and that's that's been sort of you know the, the primary center of it. it doesn't mean there isn't actually recurring revenues elsewhere within the business for example some of the hosting SaaS uh, within um you know views visualization and so forth but but you know that has been the focus and that's that's kind of the, the one of some of the key drivers behind it um yes service revenues are um relatively sort of static in absolute terms but you know as a proportion as, as the group moves ahead um obviously in, in some ways as a percentage would be lower so I hope that goes some way towards um, answering your question there. Um, it's uh, it's a business that um, you know we still continue to see opportunity for that and in, 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 in higher recurring revenues as well, of course. So uh, we, we don't stop there. Thank you, Neil. So then 
the next question from Andrew. Thank you. How does the acquisition of Vertical Digital enhance Alico's R&D capabilities and support its growth strategy? Um, I shall just re repopulate that slide just to, as a reminder. Um, certainly, um, of course, in terms of augmenting our R&D teams, um, it, it allows enhancement there. I think that the jurisdiction is a low cost jurisdiction as well, but it, it's um, the way that uh, you know the team operate is, is very very well governed. Um, they've got a lot of good skills, and it's actually a team that's um, worked together over several years and, and stuck together. So there's been low churn in terms of people, and that's really important because the, the knowledge um, that's that's with with those people. Um, the way the way that Dan and Alex, the founders, have actually operated is that they, they're very much around people and, and building teams around projects or around customers and, you know, appointing, appointing that, building that culture and the purpose. And that's really unique because the output that they're getting, that we're seeing, is very high quality. It's, it's not simply, you know, having a room full of technical folks and, and just giving them tasks it's about it's about collaborating and, and you know that's how they've attracted those really prestigious customers and, and that's how we operate internally in Alico as well uh, you know we really believe our, our, our technical colleagues really believe in what they're doing and they're really looking for creative ways to solve problems and to really address the customers needs um, and the quality as a result, the quality of software is much better. The quality of solutions is well thought out and very difficult to displace and disrupt for, you know, for, for a competitor to simply come in and not have those customer engagement, not have those interactions to build something that, that you know, is really compelling. So um, we see that, you know, there's certainly a, a synergy in terms of culture and mindset and, you know, the ability to augment our existing uh, R&D capabilities. I think the second part, you know, that how does that support our growth strategy? Well, you know, that's our lifeblood, and and you know, we're, we're, one of the pillars of our strategy is also go to market. So we're driving more product into that market. We have a fantastic customer base, and you know, we're leveraging and 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 offering more to those customers. So there is, you know, opportunity for growth there. Um, shall we? The next question is from Andrew again. Being debt free with a strong balance sheet, what are your plans for capital allocation moving forwards? Special dividend buybacks, acquisitions. So, perhaps, would you like to take that, Neil? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. And th thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so as you, as you quite rightly point out, we're obviously, in it. we are a you know, we're a technology business that's also embedded in the real world and um, and real world challenges and solving the built environment. And, and so we've got all those growth drivers and then all you add that technology on top. So and unlike other technology businesses, um, you know, we have actually probably higher gross margins than many other technology businesses. We are very cash generative. Um, you know, uh, and the operational gearing and so forth coming through. We also interestingly pay a dividend. Um, and, and, you know, as part of all this, we, you know, we've got some very long standing, very supportive shareholders um, that we're very conscious that we, you know, we, you know, stayed with us through this transition um, that we want to reward both obviously through dividend obviously, and, and increasingly so through capital growth as well. Um, so, um, you know, there is definitely an element there where we must make sure that, uh, you know, there is that, that income stream and, and that reward side of things but equally what we want to do is grow on top of our organic growth right so we really want to scale up and um, when we do that we, there is an inorganic side to that how we how we do that is you know we don't want to do you know there's 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 we see a lot of opportunity out there of course we're not don't jump at every opportunity nor should we um but we do see a lot out there and um in, in engaging all the time and you know, looking for those those uh, businesses and, and and product suites that really complement what we already have, extend our geographies uh, where sensible to do so, you know, all, all that strategic fit. But wh whatever we do, 
fundamentally, it has to be a strategic fit, but also enhance shareholder value. So that will be growing the size of the cake, even if you know it led to something very transformative and equity um, as part of that. As part of that, you know, because it has to be something that is uh, valuable to 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 all our shareholders. We that's our raison d'etre of being listed. So. The, you know, we, we have cash available, as you can rightly point out. Um, not all cash, by the way, is utilizable in the sense that you have to maintain balance sheets for commercial trading purposes, distributable reserves, tax reasons, and so forth, okay? So um, you'll always have some cash, but then equally, we have no debt. We, could, we certainly could raise significant amounts of debts if we needed to, you know, assuming taking in the business actually as part of the product portfolio as part of that. Uh, and then, yes, ultimately, if something very transformative, there may be a mix there that involves equity. But I come back to the point, it's about shareholder value and making sure that we grow that size of the cake. So, you know, we're not going to just do something silly there. And we look at all things remain on the table, dividends, buybacks, everything else. But of course, what you want is an imaginative team that can grow the business for you in the medium to long term. And that means deploying funds sensibly, but deploying funds. Thank you. So a uh, question from David S. Do you plan to leverage AI in the customer offering? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, there's already AI within the solution. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is yes. Um, we brought in the capability, additional capability last year um, with a data and AI expert that's um that actually supported and help, helped us um you know look at that Asta gpt solution or build it um but yeah i think ai is not going away uh, we're looking at it closely and you know there's been peaks and troughs when it comes to ai dating back to you know 1970s 60s um different forms of ai so we're, yeah, we're absolutely monitoring that the, it's important for, for investors to just remember, I guess, when, when we look at AI, the, the actual technology is only five to 10% of the whole, of, of you know, the AI project. We What we found is uh, that 75% um, of AI is the data and gathering the data, cleansing the data, then applying the software, the, the AI engine, and then the remainder is learning and retraining and AI makes mistakes and then it improves. So actually, for our our customers, for Alico, our customers, the industry, to implement AI effectively, we need to have clean data collected and cleansed. And, and that's the challenge because the biz, the industry is digitizing and we have been collecting a lot more data on, on projects. Um, and Alico's ambition is to support that data workflow from the early design, everything, everything that's planned to happen to everything that is happening on site, and then all the operational you know, maintenance and, and, and management. So around time and task across that portfolio. So we, we're in a good position because that's critical for every project and building. Uh, or asset or structure um, and that's a, that's the foundation I guess of our portfolio which helps I hope answer the next question which is um, looking at divestment uh, we, did we I thought I saw a question You're looking at your di your divestments that hints to you want to focus on your core yeah absolutely as I described. Um, and on the other hand, your m a agenda seems to be very wide in terms of what you can invest in. How does this fit? Yes, uh, good question, Yannick. Um, so the, the slide that uh, showed our pillars, we've got three criteria for m a but within that probably as we go in a level deeper, um, and I may have alluded to it earlier, we're, we're looking very closely at technology and how that can help accelerate our roadmap. And we're looking at that in conjunction with reviewing, constantly reviewing our product roadmaps, constantly, constantly looking at competition and looking at ways to to um, to accelerate or looking at potential partners. So the MA sort of search is, is integrated into that product piece. And that's the technique technology search. So we are looking for type fits. Uh, and when we talk, when we 
you know, when, when it comes to tech play. When it comes to customers, we're looking a little bit more broadly. So best outcome, we, we had a requirement for a program um, and portfolio management solution uh, outside of, you know, to a broader audience in our um, asset owner management audience, you know, the, the, the retail audience, we've got um, Boots, Sainsbury's, as you know, those large retailers were running, you know, storing all their project data, et cetera. And Asta was too, was, was um, you know, very, much for running complex projects. So that's where the PM3 solution is really complementary and it's broadening our, our reach, but still within the built environment. And then another opportunity could be a region or a geography, but we're, we're very much focused on growing in the markets that we've, we've presented, which is most of Europe and the US. So if we're looking at acquisition opportunities, we're looking in these geographical regions and areas. So while that, that slide may may look a bit broad in terms of, you know, it has to be profitable and you know, it has to divide, you know, have customer overlap, we're looking, of course, a layer deeper than that. And then the second part of your question, Yannick, I hope that, that answered the first part. Uh, what hurdle rate does the investment need to take? As Neil pointed out, the products terminated that do not meet standards. So what is the standard? Mm -hmm. Does that vary across investment opportunities? And, and if so, how? So, yeah, it, it's, 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 I mean, I can probably sort of build on what Johnson's mentioned there in terms of, you know, you type B, ABCs and whatever. I mean, I think for us fundamentally in this space, it's about being accretive um, and, you know, or, or, you know, very near so at the very least, such that, you know, with potential uh, and concrete potential to do so. And what, um, yeah, I mean, look, on, on, on Archon, it, it, you know, the bottom line, it just wasn't delivering in terms of that profitability for us. And it didn't really fit our sort of product roadmap and where we were going. And I sort of alluded to that earlier. In terms of EOLs, I mean, they were below sort of the, the typical sort of, um, you know, uh, as you can see, our margins tend to be at group level 88 to 90. They were below that. Um, they, you know, it's possible that you can kind of have some that are slightly lower, but at the end of the day, um, we fundamentally believe that everything has to stand on its own two feet and there's no cross subsidization there. So if there's something even better for some other companies at 60, 65, we're not going to be, we're not going to entertain that. So, you know, the, the thing for us is there are, there are lots of different hurdles and there are different metrics, you know, for different things. And it does vary a little bit between, you know, as you say, different sides and income streams of the, of the business. But, you know, in terms of the metrics for investment pro probabilities, we don't, again, some of that is commercially sensitive in what we do, but of course, you know, you just have to look at some of the recent um, metrics and the transaction metrics on best outcome or, or indeed vertical digital, you know, they're very, very favorable ones indeed. And, and you know, and I think that's because businesses want to be part of us, you know, and the culture, as Jonathan said, and, you know, just de developing um, with us, growing with us, and you know they they don't want to be uh, you know necessarily a small number in, a, in you know they want to be a contributor, a net contributor to the business. And so you know while boltons may be you know one to fifteen, or we're looking for annual growth ten to twenty, or whatever it's going to be, you know certain other metrics. The the, the point is, it's also about the strategic fit as well, of course, as the as the value. But you know, do we see that business being part? Of portfolio and growing for us as we grow and, and move forward. Um, you know, it's very, very powerful to have those people engaged and really active when they join the group and really part of the Aligo group. So I appreciate it doesn't go through absolutely everything there. Some of it's a little bit commercially sensitive, Yannick. I'm happy to pick up with you. I know we're seeing you again, which is great. And so uh, we can talk again further, uh, you know, um, and I can sort of expand a little bit more about the business. but. For the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll hand back to Jonathan now. That, that's great, Jonathan, Neil. Thank you very much indeed for updating us. Thank you, everybody, for your engagement this afternoon. Absolutely unbelievable. So thank you once again to uh, to you all. Um, Jonathan, uh, Neil, I know investor feedback will be uh, important to you both, and I'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their thoughts and their expectations. But Jonathan, before doing so, I wondered if I may just ask you for a couple of closing comments. Yeah. 
Thank you everyone for, for joining, really appreciate it. Thank you for all your questions, those was um, very good questions and hopefully we went some way to answering those. Um, as Mark said, if, if we didn't, please reach out, we're happy to take those offline. And hopefully you can see we're really excited about the journey we're on and the future, so we look forward to sharing an update at the interims. That's great. Jonathan, Neil, thank you once again for updating investors. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as we now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure it'll be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Alico, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and wish you all a very good afternoon.